Welcome to what I'll call the 2023 review, but also the 2024 Economic Update and Investment Outlook. I'm Ross Bramwell, a member of Heimerich Berg's investment team, and I'll be taking you through this quarter's presentation. To start, I'm going to summarize the main points we'll, we'll discuss. Although inflation has declined since the peak of 9.1%, down to 3.2% in October, history suggests that the Fed may have more work to do. Even if it has paused, the Fed will likely remain aggressive and hold rates steady in restrictive territory as inflation remains sticky in the 3 to 4% range. We believe the Fed is likely to remain aggressive, and even if the Fed decides to pause at current levels, we believe rates will likely be held here for longer than the markets are currently anticipating. Longer-term yields declined in November, as markets now believe that the Fed has officially paused. Another stopgap funding bill was passed, but the risk of a government shutdown next year has not been fully removed, given growing deficits, higher debt costs, and political gridlock. Tighter lending conditions have reduced available credit to consumers and companies, which should continue to slow the economic growth. However, larger savings and higher wages have kept consumers healthy and willing to spend into the holiday season. Leading economic indicators have declined for 19 consecutive months, but a tight jobs market has held off the much anticipated recession. While Q3 earnings growth of 4.8% was better than expected, company conference calls have highlighted lower revisions and weaker guidance. Q4 earnings estimates have declined from 8.4% all the way down to 3%. Estimates for next year's earnings are still above 12%, but we believe are likely to decline. If inflation declines and unemployment stays low, maybe a soft landing is possible. Markets are currently pricing in an optimistic story of no additional rate hikes, rate cuts by late spring, and double-digit earnings growth. We believe higher rates will continue to slow the economy into 2024. So where does that leave us with our portfolio positioning? Given the risk of an economic slowdown due to higher for longer rates, we have positioned portfolios accordingly with an underweight position in both domestic and international equities, and an overweight exposure to short-term bonds given the shape of the yield curve and elevated stock valuations. After the Fed's rate hikes pushed up to shorter term end of the yield curve, as we can see here, going from the end of last year until recently where the short rates are, the longer term rates have recently also begun uh, to, to rise. And this has been due to positive economic data, the increased supply of debt issuance by the U.S. government, and fewer global buyers as many have backed off of the U.S. dollar. This has increased the cost of U.S. debt and put additional pressure on Congress to negotiate around the government funding deadlines. Although another stopgap funding bill was signed in November and gave Congress more time to pass funding bills, the risk of a shutdown is not completely removed. Given the challenges of a brand new House Speaker, the growing deficit this year, where we went from over to, went over two trillion last year, was just one trillion, and the overall political gridlock related to taxes and spending options that still need to be resolved for a long-term funding bill. Even though yields have decreased in recent weeks, as markets perceive the Fed is likely done with rate hikes, 34% of the government's debt matures in the next 12 months and will have to be refinanced at significantly higher rates than when it was issued. This will continue to put pressure on Congress to have to make tough choices on government spending. It was easier to fund deficits when rates were zero. Now the U.S. government is issuing debt at rates above 5% in some cases. Given the current level of GDP and also very low unemployment, it seems more reasonable that we should be in a surplus scenario. Yet the deficit has more than doubled this year from last year to over $2 trillion. It is estimated that our interest on our debt will equal our defense budget in 2025. If the U.S. economy were to stall out next year, this would create some difficult decisions for Congress on spending and taxes. During the artificial zero interest rate years, both sides of the aisle in Congress could easily kick the can down the road, which both sides often did. At current rates, however, it's going to be hard to kick the can down past the road beyond 2024. On this chart, I just want to focus on two points. First, if you follow the headline inflation report over the last year, there's been a steady decline all the way down to 3.2% um, in last month. However, when you look at the bottom four categories, which we can refer to as core CPI, we can also see its decline, although it's been much harder to see a dramatic decline from just this group. The Fed right now is more focused on core CPI, which are the stickier parts of inflation, including housing, services, travel, food, etc. 
Until the Fed sees a steady decline in this group, it's unlikely that the Fed will be comfortable in cutting rates. Core CPI was 4% last month, which is still significantly higher than the 2% target. Chairman Powell has reiterated several times now that the 2% target has not changed. Many have argued that the Fed should have already paused because housing costs are so lagged and consequently skew the data. A chart of rents over the last month would show that housing rents are not going up nearly as much as a 12-month average in the CPI calculation. This chart supports the thesis in that if we remove housing costs from the aggregate calculation, that CPI X shelter <clears throat> or housing is already below the 2% target. I think it's also interesting to note that the CPI X shelter almost reached 11% last summer, which was higher than the 9% peak in headline CPI. Now, of course, the Fed knows this too, so it's not a secret, but it does increase the risk that if inflation is already coming down to targeted levels, and if the Fed remains in a tightening mode, that the Fed could do what the Fed has historically done, and that is break something in the economy or walk it right into a recession. Here the chart shows historic increase in money supply growth from the beginning of 2020 until early 2021. The supply growth has significantly decreased over the last 18 months. You can now see year-over-year -year money supply growth is negative. I will also point out that the peak in money supply growth was at the same time of the last fiscal bill passed during the pandemic. But inflation did not peak until 14 to 16 months later in June of 2022. This shows the lag effect of monetary and fiscal policy. This leads me to two conclusions. First, the slowdown in money supply growth should continue to put downward pressure on inflation, which is good. The second is, however, not as positive that the slowdown should also continue to weaken economic growth and put pressure on the jobs market. Taking into account our earlier discussion about government spending, you'll notice we hit a low point about four months ago around the time of the bank failures occurred this spring and the Fed provided additional lending to the system. We've also seen an increase in government spending and debt issuance this summer. Month over month money supply growth has reversed the positive growth in recent months, which has been a support for the overall economy and stock market, but may not be as helpful into the Fed or for the Fed in getting inflation further down to its target. The economy has been resilient despite the Fed's desire to slow the economy and bring down inflation. The economy has remained strong with good wage growth and a consumer that is still spending on services and travel and entertainment, as shown by the current estimate for U.S. GDP of 5.2%. But the Fed is not acting alone here as we've discussed the role of government spending. Historically, there has not been just one wave of inflation. That is still a key risk for the markets. With several areas of inflation sticky with elevated pricing, the economy needs energy to evade a sharp increase in commodity prices and for housing to continue their decline over the next six to eight months. The Fed could then begin to normalize rates or take them out of restrictive territory, which would mean a rate cut without us heading into a recession. Historically, the Fed has not stopped a rate hiking cycle before its key rate has moved higher, often significantly higher than CPI. Where the fund where the Fed funds rate is at 5.5% at and, and inflation at 3.2, this gives the Fed the option of skipping or even pausing on additional rate hikes. But we will still get another inflation report and another jobs report before the next Fed meeting. So although a pause is justified, we believe it's way too early to discuss any possibility of rate cuts in the near future. Remember, core CPI is still at 4%, so much closer to the Fed funds rate if it were to begin to cut. One of the issues the Fed has had is that the markets have not believed its messaging and guidance. Fed members have consistently messaged they expect to keep rates at peak levels through 2023 and now for most of 2024. However, after the banking crisis in March, markets were pricing in that the Fed will begin cutting rates this summer or that the Fed will likely cut rates by 1% or more by January of next year. Markets have been cheering the possibility of a pause with the expectations that a rate cut could quickly follow. Currently, markets are pricing in a peak Fed funds rate around January of early 2024, but then the markets have the Fed cutting to below 4.5% by the end of next year. Right now, a lot of good news is priced into the market, including no additional rate cuts, no recession, a soft landing scenario, and rate cuts by next spring. A miss on any one of those expectations would likely mean a setback for the markets, and we believe the markets are anticipating a cut too early.
For the last two years, Jay Powell has often talked about the significance of the job market and its important relationship to inflation. Our economy has transitioned to be a predominantly service-oriented economy. One of the largest inputs to cost in a service economy is wages. And as we have seen the last two years, wages go up when there is a higher demand for workers than the available workers looking for jobs. This is seen in the top left chart with the incredible increase in job openings after the pandemic that has only come down slightly. In the upper right hand chart, we see that we have continued to add monthly jobs over the last four to six months, even though the report has been uh, somewhat choppy each month. When we look at the bottom charts of initial and continued unemployment claims, we can see that the job market has remained relatively strong and generally those who have been laid off have been able to find another job. So overall, the job market remains very tight, even though we have seen some weakness recently. This is one of the reasons the Fed believes it may have more work to do. A year ago, the Fed estimated unemployment would be 4.7% at the end of 2023. The Fed believed an increase of over 1% in unemployment from the current rate at that time would be the consequence of raising interest rates this year in a slowing economy. Historically, increases of 1% in unemployment have coincided with recession. The Fed believes one of the keys to getting inflation down was a weaker job market. But the much anticipated recession of 2023 never happened. And one of the main reasons is the strong job market that has kept consumers employed and with cash in their pockets that they are more than willing to spend. The unemployment rate has crept up through this year from a historic low of 3.4% and is currently sitting at 3.7%. It just went down today from 3.9% um, after the November jobs report. But to get back to my main question, I believe the unemployment rate is one of the key data points the Fed is watching. If the rate continues to creep up to 4% or higher, it will indicate a slowing economy. And the Fed is likely done with rate cuts, as it could believe that the impact of the rate hikes is still filtering through the economy and will continue to slow the economy next year. But if the unemployment rate starts to dip lower back towards historical lows, like we just got with today's jobs number, then the Fed may believe it has more work to do. And that that it will likely mean higher for longer, but also that an additional rate cut may be needed in 2024. We believe the unemployment rate over the next few months may give us a clue into what direction the Fed is going in 2024. Tighter lending standards have historically led to job losses, but the economy is currently beating the odds. Here you can see in this chart historically before the gray bar where is recession as, tighting, as tighter lending standards came into place you then quickly soon after saw job losses, and you've seen this in the most recent um, recessions. The red dotted line shows that tightening lending standards have reduced the credit available to, to the economy significantly this year even, here on the far right. While the blue line has barely budged from post-pandemic lows, the Fed is betting and honestly hoping that the historical correlation will reconnect next year in order to bring inflation down further. We look closely at the leading economic indicators to evaluate the prospects of a recession. We have now had 19 consecutive months of negative LEI, which are the leading economic indicators readings. If you look at the left-hand chart, the gray bars represent prior recessions. Looking at the current decline in the LEIs, it certainly looks like we should be in a recession. But as shown in the bottom right chart, which consists of the coincident economic indicators, we can see that the job market continues to hold up and is supporting consumers and the economy in the face of several economic headwinds. Coincident indicators try to represent real-time changes in the economy, and there's still a strong trend in the jobs market, whereas we can see weakening trends in most other areas of the economy. Markets have been expecting earnings to rebound the second half of this year. Second quarter earnings were better than feared when early estimates called for a greater than 8% decline, but you can see we came in at just under negative 3%. Markets are pricing in a quick rebound in the second half, led by the same seven mega cap stocks that have made up most of the S&P 500's return this year, as those same stocks have had some of the largest expectations for improved earnings. While Q3 earnings growth of 4.8% was better than expected as well, Company conference calls have highlighted lower revisions and weaker guidance moving forward. Q4 earning estimates have declined from 8.4% all the way down to 3% currently. 
Estimates for next year's earnings growth are still above 12%, but we believe that is likely to decline as well as we expect a slowing economy. This slide is looking at earnings data for the S&P 500, but it's following the trend in expectations for earnings as time has passed. For example, the gray line at the bottom of this page shows how the expectations for 2023 for the S&P 500 companies have evolved over the last year. One year ago, analysts expected the S&P to produce about $242 of earnings per share. But over the last year, this has slowly drifted lower towards the current level of $219 representing just a 1% growth over last year's earnings. The tan line shows the expectations of S&P earnings growth for 2024. As you can see, this line has also trended slightly lower over time, but remains well above the gray line as the market is currently pricing in double digit earnings growth for 2024. If a recession were to materialize later this year or early next year, we would expect these expectations for 2024 earnings to drift lower from these levels. And this would be a further headwind in returns for the month ahead. On the chart on the right here, we're, we're showing the S&P 500 earnings and valuations and how that has accumulated to the S&P 500's total return. As you can see here in the gray line, we have the earnings growth. For much of the year, we are flat to even negative. And as I just talked about in the prior slide, we have seen an uptick in better than expected earnings. However, you can see for much of the year, the multiple growth, which is the tan line and the S&P return on the red line, were on top of each other, indicating that almost all of the return in the S&P 500 was coming from price valuation, not from earnings. It was just that investors were willing to pay more for the same amount of earnings. We then had a three month decline this fall, but recently, once again, even though we've seen a little bit in improved earnings, much of this is about valuations. Uh, investors are willing to pay more based on the optimism they have moving forward. What we wanna see internally before we become more comfortable with stocks is we wanna see this earnings actually become realized and not just being priced into the market with higher valuations. The broader stock market has been very reliant on the largest stocks for most of its return. The chart shows that the largest seven stocks that the market has named the Magnificent Seven have the same market cap as the next 39 stocks, but only 40% of the sales and just 52% of the profit. That is because the valuations of these seven stocks is much higher than the average stock. The continued strength of these stocks will be key in the near term to the market, however, as we enter 2024, because markets are expecting these same, these same seven stocks to produce much of the earnings growth that we talked about in 2024. The magnificent seven stocks are in the communications, tech, and consumer discretionary sectors. The chart here shows the year-to-date performance of each sector and for those three sectors just named, the TAM bar represents those sectors without the Magnificent Seven stocks. We can easily see the impact that those seven stocks have had on those sectors into the broader market. But the silver lining is that if we do hit a soft patch next year, this has not been a market where all stocks are priced at expensive levels. If you remove the Magnificent Seven stocks, the average stock valuation is much closer to historical averages and gives us comfort in our long-term view of stocks. And likely in an economic uh, slowdown, most of the market would hold up much better. Valuations help us gauge you know, how cheap or expensive stocks are. Let's discuss a commonly used metric called earnings yield. The earnings yield looks at the earnings generated from an investment and divides that amount by the price that is being paid for the investment. Simply put, the earnings yield is the earnings that are being generated for each dollar invested. A higher earnings yield indicates that an investment is cheaper while lower earnings yield indicates that investment is more expensive. This is particularly important valuation metric to monitor at this time because we can compare the earnings yield of the S&P 500, so stocks, to the rapidly rising rates that can be generated on cash and fixed income investments in today's market. This chart looks at the earnings yield of the S&P 500 over the past 20 years. We can see that over time, the yield has averaged about 6.6% and has been as high as 10% during the financial crisis and as low as 4% during the recent run-up in 2021. Today, the earnings yield in the S&P 500 is just around 5.5%. This is slightly lower than historical averages and in our view is by no means cheap given the current uncertain economic environment. And as we'll see shortly, the attractive yields that can be generated on lower risk investments in fixed income. 
Taking a step back and thinking about the information we have talked about so far, we believe that we are in an environment where an elevated risk of an economic slowdown could in impact corporate earnings going forward. At the same time, valuations on the equity markets are not cheap, and the yield on the short-term high-quality fixed income instruments is as attractive as it has been in 20 years. All of this has led us to take a cautious view on the stock market and to be slightly underweight stocks in portfolios, instead favoring an overweight position in short-term high-quality bonds. Markets are highly anticipating when the Fed will pause and even begin rate cuts. These are important assumptions that investors use to price the overall market in individual stocks. However, historically, rate cuts have not been a positive for the stock market. U.S. stocks have done okay after a pause, on average up mid-single digits over three to four months. But after the first rate cut, the S&P 500 has declined, on over, has declined over 20% on average over the next eight to 10 months. Historically, the market has not bottomed before a recession or before the first rate cut. The Fed is typically cutting rates because economic conditions are weakening. So a pause, even a rate cut, does not mean we've achieved a soft landing. Now, we are certainly in unprecedented times when historical norms are not leading to the predicted and typical outcomes. But until we have clarity on when the Fed will pause and for how long, or until we see economic indicators bottom and move higher, we are likely to stay more cautious in our outlook. This chart just makes the same point that markets should not necessarily cheer a rate cut, as the chart on the left shows that yes, markets can move higher between the last rate hike and the first rate cut, but the chart on the right shows that historically markets have moved into correction and even bear territory on average after the Fed begins to cut rates. We believe it'll be difficult for the Fed to cut rates if the economy keeps growing at the current rate. It'll likely only cut if economic conditions begin to deteriorate. Now I'm just gonna spend a few minutes on politics since we are now less than a year away from the 2024 presidential election. As I've always stated, it is very unlikely that we will make allocation changes around election cycles. Political events tend to only have short-term moves up or down until longer-term implications and legislation is hammered out, which may be very difficult in the current environment. We have taken similar stances with many geopolitical events that tend to have short but very unpredictable moves in the market. We firmly believe that earnings are the long-term driver of markets. An election event just on its own does not lead to long-term changes in earnings. It's more important to follow the legislation or policies that could change the direction of earnings and the markets. But there are some interesting points of data that I'll point out since it is of interest to everyone. First, if you are expecting President Biden to run as the incumbent, markets have performed better when there is an incumbent running versus an open election. In fact, the market has always been positive in those years when incumbent is running, as shown in the upper left chart. The bottom right chart makes the same point but shows the average return through the election uh, year, and it's historically been much better when it's a re-election year. One of the main reasons that likely the markets tend to be up in a re-election years is that the first term president typically leans on stimulative policies ahead of elections. The chart on the right shows that GDP is typically higher in the fourth year of a presidential cycle. Given the same amount of fiscal and policy stimulus that we're seeing currently in the system, this is unlikely to change next year in 2024. Even though the market historically had positive returns in a re-election year, Every year has corrections. The corrections just tend to be smaller, as shown on the right, around 8% versus 18%. And the market tends to outperform if the president is reelected versus if the incumbent loses, as shown on the left. We currently have narrow margins for control in the House and Senate. And that may be unlikely to change next year. The Democrats will play offense in the House and try to take it back as the GOP is defending more seats that Biden won. But in the Senate, of the 33 seats up for election, 23 are held by Democrats or independents that caucus with the Democrats. Given our recent history of special elections needed in tight races, once again, control in Congress may not be determined in early November. But with all these fun and interesting facts, it's most important to remember that, that history shows that the stock market is rather nonpartisan. Both parties have raised and lower taxes. Both have created large deficits. And all along the way, corporate America continues and the U.S. continues to be the most innovative and ever-evolving economy in the world. We will continue to follow the candidates and potential policy changes, but we don't expect to be making significant allocation changes 
just based on election trends before the presidential election. Thanks for watching this presentation. If you have any further questions, please reach out to a member of your client service team. Thanks again.